Hi and welcome to the next in this series of screencasts on programming for psychology, data analysis and visualization. So in this screencast we're going to be looking at some components of experimental design. So particularly power analysis and how we can visualize the outcomes of these power analyses. Okay, so the objectives of this lesson. First you want to be able to perform power calculations using um, simulation approaches. So we're going to look at how we can use um, programming and code to perform um, power calculations using simulations. And also how you can create and use line and image plots to depict the outcomes of these power simulations. So power relates to the ability to detect the presence of a true effect and is an important component of experimental design. So what we're going to be doing in this lesson is to um, consider a, a really a general purpose approach to estimating the power of an experimental design. So we're going to start by considering a scenario in which we have an effect size and a sample size in mind and we want to know the power of this design. So for our example experiment we're going to have a between subjects design with two factors, 30 participants per group and we're going to assume a large effect size. So you might recognize this design as it's the same that we used in the previous lesson to demonstrate the operation of the independent samples t-test. So here we're going to determine the power of this test. So let's go over to, to Spider as usual. So the key to determining power using a simulation approach is to leverage this computational capacity that we have now that we can write our own programs. So we're going to perform a large number of simulated experiments, each time calculating our independent samples t-test and accumulating the number of times we're able to reject the null hypothesis. So then the, the power is this proportion of times that we're able to do so. Remembering that we, in this simulation, we control the population means and we know that there is actually a true difference. What we want to know is how, what's our ability to detect this true difference. Okay, so let's calculate the power for this particular design. So we'll start by importing numpy. So we're also going to need scipy.stats. Okay, so let's set some of these um, variables. n per group is 30. And group means will be 0 and 0.8. Group sigmas will be 1.0. Number of groups. Again, we'll do a large number of simulations, so 10,000. We want to store the p value for each simulation. Which we'll initially fill with NANDs. Okay, so now we want to loop over our simulations. We'll initialize some empty data. And we'll loop over each group. Each time generating some random data for this particular condition, this particular group. Okay, so we've simulated the data, so now what we want to do is to form our t-test comparing the first and the second groups and we'll save the p-value now we'll count the number of times the null hypothesis was rejected convert that into a proportion and print out the result. 
Okay, so let's go through what we're doing here. So what we're doing is simulating between subjects design with a large effect size. So we have 30 participants per group. The mean of the first group is zero. The second group is 0.8. So for each of 10,000 simulations, we're going to generate um, some data corresponding to these two uh, populations. Then we're going to perform a t-test to see if we can detect uh, this true difference between the group means and we're going to store the p-value. Then we're going to count how many times we've been able to reject the null hypothesis and that is what we call our power. So now if we save this and run it, we can see that we get a power of about 0 0.85, 0 0.86. So this is the, the power of this experimental design. Okay, so that should all be fairly straightforward. It's just the, the flip side of what we were doing um, last lesson. But when we go on to more complex examples, um, the number of simulations that's required is going to increase. So we want to rearrange this code a little bit so that it can run um, as, as fast as possible. So let's make a few, few tweaks to it. In particular, we're going to generate the simulated data all at once and then use the axis argument to the t-test calculation to perform it over the whole array. Okay, so let's start making some adjustments here. So what we're going to do is define our data to be an empty array, but now it's going to have three dimensions. The first is going to be the number of simulations, then the number of participants per group, and then the number of groups. And we'll fill it with NANs. Okay, so we're not looping over simulation anymore, so we can get rid of that. And we can get this back. So now we want to loop over our groups still. But now the data, we want to just not only um, generate data for each participant, we also want to generate over multiple simulations. So now again, we can use random.normal with the group means, the groups and the deviations. But now the size, rather than being uh, 30, we're going to have it be two dimensions with the number of simulations as the rows and the number of, part of participants as the columns. So now this um, random.normal is going to generate uh, 10,000 by uh, 30 uh, values rather than just, just the 30 we had before. Okay, so now we've filled up the, the data, we can calculate the result using the same again, but now, let's get this on different lines. Rather than just looking over all participants, we're going to look over all simulations and all participants for both these two um, variables. And we want to tell the scipy um, function that we want it to perform the t-test over axis one. So over participants, perform the t-test. So result, rather than being just one t-test, will actually hold 10,000 different t-tests. So now SIMP is going to be held in the first um, result here. So this should give us exactly the same answer, well, um, with subject to the sort of randomness, should give us the same answer as what we did before. So if we save it and run it, we can see now we have a the similar sort of result, but it's been able to we've been able to get there using um, some code that will make it run a lot faster. So this will be helpful for for future parts of this lesson. Okay, so in this example, what we were doing was calculating the power given a particular effect size and a particular number of uh, participants per group. So now we're going to look onto a, a more common scenario where you have a design and an effect size in mind and you want to know what sample size you would need to achieve a particular power. So 80% is a typical sort of a, a power aim, um, but 90% is also um, becoming more popular. So this is a, a straightforward extension of the example that we've just done. What we do is we, we start with a, a sample size and we calculate its power. And then we keep doing this repeatedly, each time changing the sample size until our powers reached the desired level. So let's see how we can do that. So first let's define a variable desired power. So here we want to uh, find out what sample size we need to get a power of 
So now let's define another variable that's going to hold our current power. So let's set it to a low number. So we started at zero. So we're saying when we first begin, we don't have um, the power that we need, so perform the, the calculations. So now we're going to use a while loop. So we're going to while current power is less than the desired power, we're going to perform some calculations. So again, we can generate our data. We want that to be indented, indented. Indented Okay, so now we have a we've calculated a particular level of power for this sample size. So let's store that in the variable current power as prop reject and let's print out our progress. So print with n samples per group power equals format so n will be our n per group p will be our current power now we're at the last line here of our while loop so what we want to do is increase our n per group so let's set that to be one more than what it is at the moment. So this plus equals is the same as if we were to do n per group equals n per group plus one. Okay, let's think about what's going to happen here. So we're starting off by setting current power to zero. So current power is going to be less than 0.8. So let's run our power calculations. We'll get out our power level, stored it in current power. We'll print it out. We'll increase the um, sample size per group. And we'll go up here. Now that we've changed current power, if it's less than desired power, we'll do our calculations again. But remember that now we've increased our sample size a little bit. So the current power will change. And then we keep doing this over and over again until at some point our current power will get greater than our desired power, will exit out of the loop and the program will finish. So let's save it and run it and have a look at it in operation. Okay, so you can see that it's only done this once because with 30 samples per group, the power was already greater than um, 0.8. So let's reduce the number of samples down to 20. So now we're gonna start with 20 participants per group. We'll run it again. All right, so you can see that with 20, our power was 0.7. As we increased, power is still 0.7. We keep going up by one sample, and eventually we get to the um, point where with 26 participants per group, our power is greater than 0.8, so we've finished. So what we can say then is if with this particular design, assuming this particular effect size, to get 80% power, we'll need 26 samples per group. Okay, so in that example, we looked at what the uh, sample side we would need to give us a given level of power. However, maybe we don't have a single level of power in mind, but we just want to see what the relationship between sample size and power is, so we can work out where we want to um, position ourselves for our experimental design. So we're going to have a look at how we can do that. So we're going to use a similar approach to what we did just now, except we're going to perform the simulations across a fixed set of sample size. Then we're going to save those um, power values to disk so we can use them in a, a visualization without having to rerun all the analyses. Okay, so rather than n per group, we're going to have n per group, and we're going to have from 10 to 51 going up by increments of 5. So that'll look at 10 participants, 15, 20, 25, and so on up to 50 participants per group. So let's also look at the number of these different n variations we're going to do, which will be the length of these n's per group array. Okay, so now what we're going to do is going to calculate a power for each of these variations of sample size. 
So we want to define an, n array, an empty array with n n's of size and we'll fill it with an n. Okay, so now what we want to do is loop over our sample sizes. So for i n in range n n's. So the n per group for this iteration will be the n's per group for this index. Okay, so then we can do our simulation as, as we did before. This will all be the same. But now rather than changing current power, we want to store the power that we've obtained for this sample size as the proportion rejected. We don't want to print anything out. Okay, so now we have uh, power. So this will be an array of each of these different sample sizes showing the, the power for that um, particular sample size. So now what we want to do is we want to save that to disk. So we want to save both the power and the uh, sample size associated with each power. So let's make an array called array to save. And what we want to do is we want to horizontally stack these two one-dimensional arrays. So we use this function hstack. So we give it a list where the first, so the first column is going to be our n's per group. So at the moment this is a um, one-dimensional array but because we want to stack them in columns what we want to do is convert that into an array that has um, n rows and one column. So we do this by using a, a new axis um, property here which will convert this into um, an array with one column. And we'll do the same thing with power Okay, so now what we've done is we've converted these two one-dimensional arrays into a two-dimensional array with two columns. Now let's give it a file name. It's called prog data is power sim data tsv, and we'll save it. Our path. Tab separated, simulated power as a function of samples per group. Okay, so now if we save that and run it, so it's performed all these calculations and saved them to disk. So let's just open it up and see what it looks like. Okay, so now you can see our sample size is going up by so 10, 15, 20, and the other column contains the associated power. All right, so now we're going to start our visualization code. So MP will begin by loading this data that we've just saved. So power path was prog data viz power sim data tsv. And we'll save it and we'll load it into power load txt power path limiter equals tab. Now we'll pull out a few variables from this. So the number of sample size variations is the number of rows. The ends per group is the first column in this power array, and the power per and equals the second column in this power array. Okay, so if we save that and run it, just make sure everything's okay. Yep, that's completed successfully. Okay, so now we're going to use some familiar techniques to set up a one-panel figure. So as usual, we'll import views.embed and we'll start putting together our figure. So I'll just have it as a one column and not all that high. Okay. 
add our axes. So now let's do those usual formatting things that we do. Let's do them up front. So first we'll turn off the border. And we'll set the typeface. Okay, so now this should set up our usual um, one panel figure. Save it and run it. Yep, so there's our, our figure ready to populate. Okay, so now what we want to do is plot the sample size per group on the horizontal axis and the associated power on the vertical axis. So we're going to use the familiar by now XY figure type. So as you know, we first have to tell views about our data. So we use embed.set data ends per group is the array ends per group and we also tell it about the power per ends it's power per ends and we add our xy and we set our x data to be the ends per group we set the y data to be the power Per ends. Okay, so now if we save that and run it, all right. So you can, now we can start to see the the relationship here, as we're increasing the sample size per group here on the horizontal axis. What the effect of the power shown here on the vertical axis is. So you can see this sort of decelerating relationship. So let's make a few um, other formatting changes to this figure just to make it um, improve its appearance a bit. Okay, so let's set the tick marks on the horizontal axis to be manual. And what we'll do is we'll set it to every second item in the ends per group array. So remember we can do that by doing colon colon two, and then we need it in the format of a list. Okay, now let's turn off the minor ticks. Let's give it a label. So here we do actually have a, a meaningful label. Um, we'll call it sample size per group. And we'll set its minimum value as a float of the min of n per group. And we'll add a bit of five padding. And we'll set the max the float mp dot max of the ends per group and plus five padding. Okay, so now for the vertical axis, it seems sensible since we know that this is you know, guaranteed to be bounded between zero and one to use this whole range here. So let's set the minimum to be zero and let's set the maximum to be one. And let's give it a label, which is the power for d equals 0.8. Okay, so now if we save that and run it, now you can see we have a, have a nice figure depicting this relationship between the sample size per group and the obtained power for this particular design. Okay, so in that example, we've been assuming a fixed effect size, in particular a large effect size. However, maybe we want to investigate how power changes with both effect size and sample size. So again, this is a, a, a straightforward extension of what we've already done. So we'll again save it to disk so we can then visualize it without having to rerun all the simulations. Let's close this. And again, we'll, we'll start afresh by importing numpy. We're going to, again, we're going to need scipy. Right, 
So we want to vary across our sample size again. So let's define it the same between 10 and 51, going up in increments of 5. Again, let's define how many of these there are. Okay, so now we also want to um, vary the effect size. So let's find a list that's going to be the effect sizes. It's going to be range between, let's go, have it go between 0 0.2, which is a bit less than a, a small effect size, up to 0 0.91, which is a bit bigger than a large effect size. And let's go up in increments of 0 0.1. Let's see how many of those we get and effect sizes equals len effect sizes. Okay, so now the power that we want to calculate is again going to be an empty array, but now it's going to be two dimensions. We want to have the n effect sizes and the n ends. And again we fill it with n ends. Okay, and again we want to define the number of simulations. So we'll do 10,000 again. So now we need to do um, two loops. So the outer loop we're going to do for this uh, particular effect size in range and effect sizes. So for this particular um, inside this loop, the group means are going to be 0.0, .0 for the first group and the effect sizes for this particular effect size and these sigmas are both going to be 1 and groups equals len group means as we're used to seeing. So for everything inside this particular iteration of the loop the effect size is going to be this particular effect size in turn across this range of effect sizes. So now we want to loop over the number of participants so we want the i n in range n ends. So the n per group for this iteration is going to be the ends per group for this particular index. Now we want to initialize the empty data, which the size of the number of simulations by the number of participants per group by the number of groups. And we want to fill it with NANDs. Okay, so now we want to simulate our data. So for our group in range and groups, the data for all these simulations, for all these participants, for this particular group, sample from a random distribution with a location corresponding to the group means for I this particular group with a scale corresponding to the group sigmas for the nice particular group and with a size of the number of simulations and the number of participants per group. Okay, so now we have all our data for this combination of an effect size and a number of participants. So let's calculate the t-tests, scipy.stats.ttest independent with data, all our simulations, all our participants of the first group, data, all our simulations, all our participants for the second group, and telling the function that we want it to operate over axis equals one. Now our simulated p-values are contained in the first index in this result um, um, list. Now I can calculate the number of um, times we've rejected the null hypothesis as the sum of where simulated p is less than 0.05. Convert this into a proportion and save it for this particular effect size, this particular sample size as the proportion rejected. Okay, so now we've filled up our power array. Let's just make sure that is the case. P dot sum, p dot is nan power equals 
zero. So now we've filled it up, we want to save it. So again, we'll define a path as prog data is power x size by sample size sim data .tsv. And we can use save text to save this two dimensional data to power path. Save power limiter equals tab header will be simulated power as a function of samples per group and effect size. Okay, so now if we save it and run it, we'll generate these power estimates over both changes in the effect size and changes in the number of participants. So let's run that. Might take a little while as it has to perform quite a few simulations. All right, so it's all finished, finished now. Okay, so now it's all saved to disk. We can think about how to visualize it. But as usual, um, I need to start by loading it. So again, we'll import NumPy as MP. Our power path is prog data is power effect size by sample size sim data .tsv. We can load that into power using the load text function, telling it what the limiter is. Now we can pull out some um, variables based on this array. So the number of effect sizes is the shape, the first index. The number of ends is the shape, the second index. And now we didn't actually save our variations in the number of participants per group or the effect sizes. So let's regenerate them. So the ends per group was mp.a range going from 10 to 51 in levels of five. Whereas the effect sizes was mp.a range from 0.2 to 0.91 in steps of 0.1. Okay. Now if we save that and run it, yep, so that's all completed successfully. So now we have some two dimensional data that we want to visualize. So for each combination of effect size and sample size per group, we have a associated power value. So to visualize these um, two dimensional data, we're going to look at a new figure type. This is called an image. So we'll first set up our, our figure framework as usual. So embed. Add a page. Again, it'll just be one column. We'll add a graph. And some axes. And we'll do some of our usual figure formatting that we do. So we'll turn the border off. We'll set the typeface. Okay, so now we've set up our figure as usual. We've done our normal formatting operations. So let's save it and run it and make sure everything's okay. Yep, so we've got our blank figure in there ready to be populated. Okay, so as usual, the first step is to tell views about our data, but here we're going to use a, a new function. So rather than embed.setData, we're going to use embed.setData2D to tell it that we've got this two dimensional data that we want it to know about. So embed set data 2d and we're going to give it a name we'll call it power 
and this will be associated with the array that we've got power. So now what we can do is we can tell views what the dimensions of the array correspond to. So we can say the x center, so the, the center of each of the x values will be the n's per group, and the y center will be the effect sizes. Okay, so now views knows about this 2 d array called power, it knows that the columns correspond to the n's per group, and knows that the rows correspond to the effect sizes. So now let's add a new figure type called IM, we'll call it IMG. We'll add to the graph an image, and we'll tell it that the data for this image will be obtained from what we've told uh, views that is held in the string called power. Okay, so if we save that and run it. Okay, so now you can see we have um, this image um, data type in, in views that produces this uh, two-dimensional grid where the intensity of each um, cell here corresponds to the power of this combination of sample size on the horizontal axis here and um, effect size on the vertical axis here. Okay, so let's clean up the appearance of the figure a little bit. So the first thing we'll do is, again, it's got, this power has a quite a natural range, so from 0 to 1. So let's set the minimum value of our image to be 0 and the maximum value to be 1. Again, so the horizontal axis, let's set the major ticks to be manually set. And we'll set them to be every second um, sample size again. We'll also turn off the minor ticks. And we'll give it a label. For the y-axis, we'll do something similar. So we'll set it to be all of the items in the effect sizes. We'll turn off the minor ticks. We'll give it a label. And we'll set its maximum to be <clears throat> slightly larger than the uh, maximum effect size that we have. Alright, if we save that and run it. Alright, so we see it looks a bit nicer now. We, we know the, the sample size per group and we have a nice indication of the effect size. Okay, but a really sort of glaring deficiency in the current um, figure is a lack of information about what the intensity in each cell represents. So to fix this, we want to add a color bar to the graph. But as you can see, we don't really don't have much room at the moment. So first thing we're going to do is make a bit of room for it by increasing the vertical page size and adding a bit of a margin up here at the top. So we can do that quite simply. So for the page's height, we're going to set that to about 12 centimeters. And now what we want to do is for the graph, we'll set its top margin to be, say, 3 centimeters. Okay, so if we save that and run it, so that now we've given ourselves a bit of room up at the top of the um, graph here that we can add in a color bar. So adding a color bar is fairly straightforward, but one thing we need to do is when we add this image, we give it a name. So let's give it a name, let's call it name equals power image. That way we can tell the color bar which um, views uh, figure type to, to bind to. So now we've given that a name, let's create a color bar called key bar, c bar equals graph.add color bar. So now we've added a color bar. We want to tell it what, what colors it's representing. So this is held in its property called widget name.val. So this is power image. So you can see here the 
with our image we've called a power image so that for the color bar we refer it to this particular um, figure type now let's set its horizontal position to be in the center we'll set its vert or position to be manually defined and we'll position it at about minus 0.35 and we'll give it a label okay so the final thing we need to do is when we're changing these properties of the x and y axis let's also change the properties of the color bar while we're there okay so now if we save it and run it you can see that now in our figure we have a, a color bar that's telling us the relationship between the intensity of each cell and the power that it represents. Okay, so going back to the objectives for this lesson, firstly we wanted to be able to know how we can do these power calculations. So we looked at this general purpose computational simulation approach that we can use. We also wanted to create and use line and image plots to um, depict the outcomes of these power calculations.